Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Building Performance, Energy Efficiency, and Reductions at Home webinar. My name is Benjamin John, and I am the Climate Change and Energy Specialist for the Georgian Bay Biosphere. And thank you very much for joining myself and Miles today for this webinar. We're going to jump right in. And at this point, I imagine most of us have participated in either a Zoom meeting or a Zoom webinar before. But just in case, I want to start by pointing out some features. There is a Q&A tool feature, um, should be located e at either the top or the bottom of the screen uh, near your stop video and mute button. Um, if you have a question at any time in the webinar, please put it in there. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Miles' presentation is roughly 35 to 40 minutes in length, so there will be uh, plenty of time as well to answer your questions that you have. Also note that we will be recording today's session and uploading it to our YouTube channel following the webinar. Um, a link to the video and other resources mentioned by Miles today uh, will also be circulated with you at the end. Uh, we're going to turn our cameras off during the presentation, so please don't worry if you can't see us. As we wait, however, for a few more people to join in, I'd like to share a little bit about the Georgian Bay Biosphere. We're one of 18 UNESCO World Biospheres found here in Canada, and our region is ecologically unique with the largest freshwater archipelago on Earth. Um, our biosphere here it stretches 200 kilometers from the Severn River to the French River and was designated back in 2004. We are a registered charity with an office located in Perry Sound, and we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to do our conservation and education work. Before we begin, we'd also like to acknowledge the land that we are on. Uh, the Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the treaty territories of the Huron-Robinson Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920, located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of Indigenous peoples in this territory and works towards respectful and reciprocal relationships as we are all caretakers of the land. Um, I will now th turn things over to our presenter, Miles Donahue, who has developed an excellent and informative webinar and presentation for us today. Miles? Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm hoping everybody can see me here. Anyway, let's get started with the presentation. What I've done is I've actually taped the presentation just to, uh, uh, just to make things a little easier. And so what do you say we get started? Well, thank you for joining us for uh, Let's try this again. Well, thank you for joining us for uh, today's session on energy conservation at home. And what I'd like to do is we'd like to talk about uh, we. Ways that we can reduce our energy use at home and reduce our impact on the environment. Our greenhouse gas input, etc. Uh, if we consider that uh, buildings account for approximately you know, one third of the total energy use in Canada, and homes account for the greatest majority of buildings, uh, you can see we could have a major impact on uh, clean, both greenhouse gas productions and on reducing the cost of operation of, uh, of a home. So let's look at where energy use occurs in the home. Okay, typical household, we're looking at uh, 1,347 petajoules of energy. Uh, that's a scientific term. We don't what, where it's being used is we're using about 59% of it for space heating. We're using another 18% for, for water heating. Our plan 
plants use accounts for about 15%. And that's been creeping up in the last few years, given automation in homes, uh, home offices, computers, etc. Lighting accounts for about 5%. And space uh, cooling, we're looking at about 3%. So we can make a substantial difference in uh, our energy use in the home just by doing some improvements. And if you'll notice where the two biggies are, uh, we're looking at space heating and water heating. But let's start out with the easy stuff first. Okay, so strategy. Well, number one, prioritize your upgrades. Okay, so develop a plan based on your goals, including the energy performance level. Uh, if you're going to be expanding the home, you're going to be putting an addition on, then maybe that's the time to have a look at doing additional insulation on the exterior, et cetera. Uh, if you're not planning on expanding the home, then basically what you want to look at is if you want to look at, okay, what can I do to reduce the energy use in the home and do it on a cost-effective basis. So return on investment. Here's where cost effectiveness comes in. Where possible, give priorities to upgrade that provide the greatest savings per cost. So you look at things like attics, you look at things like basements, and they're easy enough to insulate. And uh, uh, it might be that your furnace has reached the end of its lifetime. Okay, then possibly time to replace it. But you want the greatest savings per cost on it. Okay, and then the third one, if you're looking at a multi-year plan, sequence your upgrades. If possible, perform the upgrades to reduce heat loss before upgrading the heating system. Reason for that is you could significantly reduce the heating requirements of the home and then find that if you've upgraded the furnace prior to doing insulating and air sealing, then what you've actually done is now your furnace is oversized. Okay. reduces the efficiency slightly, but uh, also the larger the furnace, the more expensive they are. So what we can look at first is let's start out looking at the easy stuff, electrical consumption strategies. Okay, we're looking here at number one time of use, and this has got nothing to do with reducing your actual total energy use. What it's got to do with is what time of day you use it. And here in Ontario, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had three different costs for electricity. We had on-peak, we had mid-peak, and we had off-peak, okay? And as you'll see in a minute, uh, the time of use actually makes a substantial difference in what that hydro is costing you. Second strategy we can look at here is reducing loads. And we can look at that right across the board. So, were there time shift savings? Well, on peak to off peak, 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour. On peak to mid peak, 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour. Mid peak to off peak, 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour. So, anything you can do in off peak, you've got the potential to save a minimum of 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour and quite possibly 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour which can make a major difference in your, uh, uh, in your total electrical bill. Okay, well, the major items we can look at are heating and cooling effects, dishwasher, laundry, shower, what time of day do you do those? Hobbies and home office, well, if you can work in the heat, uh, 5.2 cents a difference in kilowatt hour during the time that you're working. Timer on the water heater. Okay, if you've got an electric water heater, try turning it on so that uh, setting a timer up on it so that it comes on at, let's say, 10 p.m. and goes off at about 8 a.m. That way your water heater is operating during off peak and it's saving you five cents a kilowatt hour. Most of the water heaters now have enough insulation that they would provide hot water for at least a 24 hour period uh, before the water cool 
pulls off in them. So that gives you lots of water for uh, uh, running your dishwasher, laundry, showers, etc. Okay, we're going to heating set back or set forward. Basically what we're looking at here is the easiest way to do it. You can go by adjusting the thermostats and turning it down at night before you go to bed, turning it up first thing in the morning and walking around with cool feet until it warms up. Or if they're programmable, you can set them for what time of the day the temperature goes up, what time of day the temperature drops back. Um, the nice thing about doing that is that you can set it for at 10 o'clock at night and then at 6 a.m. before we get up during the day if there's nobody home in the house. What's it give you? Well, you're looking at a minimum of 5% reduction in heating cost. Okay, if we look at majority of homes, that's 60% of our uh, total energy use. In order for it to be effective, you need about a five degrees Fahrenheit setback for four hours minimum. Greatest savings, of course, is going to be during on peak, okay, and then set forward during mid or off peak. So, doing that, you can achieve basically you can get a five percent reduction in your in your electrical cost and quite probably in your gas, oil, or propane cost as well. It accounts for a small portion of your total energy use, but there's an uh, improvement in that. One is reduce the on time. Shut lights that you're not using, put them on time to be on, leave it off. The other one is we can reduce the wattage for the same amount of light. Okay, and the way we do that is we look at what type of light bulb we're using. And this chart shows for six compact fluorescent in an LED. You notice the incandescent uses 100 watts to produce that 1600 lumens of light. Compact fluorescent, 23 watts, and an LED, 10 watts for the same amount of light. So makes it worthwhile to look at LEDs. If we're looking at them, okay, one of the things you may want to be aware of is when you get into compact fluorescence and LEDs, they have different light colors available. Incandescents are all around the 2700 to 3000, which is a soft white yet in the CFLs and the LEDs, you can get them, and then you can also get 6,000, which is what they call daylight. Typically, bright whites are the only place where you're working, okay, rather than sitting around lounging, and then stick with the soft whites in the, in the other areas, living rooms, bedrooms, etc. So, Lighting, 90% off your total lighting cost. Okay, appliances. Well, 15%. How do we get by it? Eliminate them, use smaller appliances, or unplug them when they're not in use. And by eliminate, you know, if we look at uh, how many people have got stuff plugged in that they are not using, okay, whether it's a uh, second fridge, a freezer, uh, et cetera. Uh, use smaller. Well, my wife and I have started using the toaster oven now to do a lot of our baking. It uses about one tenth the electricity of the big oven. Okay, and then unplug. And that's the unplug. We'll get to the phantom loads in, uh, in just a minute, but it gives you uh, an idea that uh, if you unplug them, they are not drawing any electricity. When you're looking at replacing appliances, I would suggest you look at the inner guide information for the manufacturer and you can 
incur the operating costs. Okay, so when you're looking at replacing your fridge, uh, every fridge has got an inner guide rating on it. Compare the costs and use that as a factor when you're looking at, at uh, uh, replacement. And then also we can test older appliances and we'll get to that in just a minute. Let's take an example here. We've got the beer fridge, okay. Uh, usually sitting in the basement, very rarely used, uh, or it's got a half a dozen beer in it. Okay, you figure that's ah, not very much. Let's have a look. Okay, we did a test draw on the beer fridge, this particular one that we saw here. And 0.12 kilowatts per hour, that was using a meter. Now, we take that test draw, we multiply it by 8,760 number of hours in a year, and you come up to 1,051.2 kilowatt hours. That's we're getting a little more now. Multiply that by the average cost per kilowatt hour of electricity, which is 21.7 cents, including delivery fees, and we get a total operating cost of $228.11 a year. You buy an awful lot of beer for that. Uh, you might want to unplug this guy when it's not in use, or you may want to replace it with something that's an equivalent size. And if you'll notice what the rating is on this one, we're down to 550 kilowatt hours per year. Okay, makes a big difference. Uh, the major ones that we've got are stoves, washers, dryers, and refrigerators and freezers. And those are the ones with the, uh, the guide rating uh, labels on. One other area that we get, uh, and it's becoming more and more prevalent, is what we call a phantom load. And that's anything with a light or a clock, okay? And it's used for instant on. And it accounts for about 5% of a typical hydro bill. And that's just the thing sitting there waiting for you to go press the button on the remote or, or uh, press the button to turn it on. If you've got an Energy Star unit, such as TV or uh, uh, computer, okay, it allows a maximum of three watts per unit when they're shut off. Best way to deal with these guys, power bars with timers or off switches. Just to give you an example, uh, in my office, what I found was between the uh, photocopier and my printer and my computer, etc., I was drawing approximately 30 watts per hour with everything shut off. In other words, wasn't using any of it. And that 30 watts per hour, 24 hours a day, I was looking at about 600 bucks a year just to be able to go tick and turn it on again. Okay, uh, put them on a power bar with a timer on it, and I can shut them off for 16 hours a day, still have them available when I need them. And I can actually turn the timer on or off any time that I feel like, so I can uh, I can work work in the office at any time. I just got to wait two minutes for my computer to boot up again. <laughs> we talked earlier about metering. We looked at that fridge. Uh, a lot of libraries have a kilowatt meter uh, available for loan. Basically, what you do with it is you plug that into the wall. You plug the appliance into it. You leave it plugged in for one hour, you take a kilowatt hour reading off of the uh, meter, and you multiply that by 8,760, and that will give you your energy use uh, out of that appliance. You can then use that to compare to, uh, uh, if you're looking at potentially purchasing a new one, okay, and you can, you can see what savings you should be able to achieve by purchasing a new one. You'll reference that to the uh, to the uh, rating on the label on the appliance. So we pretty much covered the electrical. There's not a whole lot left in there to uh, uh, to be able to get at. So let's take a look at the heating, cooling, and comfort. Here's our big. Remember, we're talking about 59% of the total energy use in the home goes towards heating and cooling. Okay, so. 
looking at about 60% of total household energy use, but because of the fuels that we used, we're looking at 80 to 90% of the carbon dioxide output, okay, is due to the heating. Okay, so what strategies have we got to, uh, to be able to uh, deal with this? Well, first one is reduce heat loss. Okay, that one's quite simple. You, uh, if you've got under insulated surfaces, uninsulated surfaces, and we'll get to those in a few minutes, but get insulation in place. Uh, reduce air leakage in the home. Okay, second one is you want to consider what fuel that you're using. Okay, because basically fuels have got a wide range of carbon dioxide output per million BTUs. And the BTUs is a measure of the actual heat output and what the carbon dioxide output per BTUs is showing us is some of them are much worse than others to use. And we'll get into the fuel types in just a couple of minutes. And we also want to look at system efficiency. When we're, uh, when we're looking at, uh, at replacing the heating system, okay, the system efficiency vary all over the place. You do want to pay attention to, uh, uh, to how efficient the system is that you're looking at purchasing. So, uh, one of the methods that you can use that are available to you, okay, is to have a home energy assessment done. And basically what the energy assessment is going to do is it's going to evaluate the home, look at insulation levels throughout the home, uh, do a blower door test on it to determine what the air leakage rate is and where air leakage is occurring. And, and we also evaluate the heating domestic water, cooling systems, and ventilation system in the home. So what it gives you is an assessment of current usage and location of heat loss. Recommends upgrades to improve the efficiency and reduce the carbon output. And documents energy and carbon reductions for each recommendation. So gives you something that you can now use to uh, make decisions on how you want to prioritize recommendations. So let's have a look at, at, at an assessment report. This one was done for a home in North Bay and it's, uh, uh, it's a fairly typical home built in 1970, bungalow, it's got an attached garage. Okay, if we look at the graph on the right, it shows that the current energy use for the home is 150 gigajoules per year, okay? Potential, given the recommended upgrades, we're looking at 115 gigajoules per year. And for comparison, a typical new house, okay, of the same size and layout is gonna be 94 gigajoules per year. So let's have a look at what we're recommending here. Well, one, insulate the attic, you notice right beneath it is the savings, 13 gigajoules per year. Upgrade the heating system, another seven. Perform air sealing, another six. Upgrade the domestic hot water system, and we've got another seven gigajoules a year. And down on the bottom, what it's really showing is we've got a greenhouse gas reduction, 1.7 metric tons per year. That's quite a substantial uh, reduction in, in greenhouse gases. Here's showing if you were to do the recommended upgrades, okay, currently you're producing six and a half million ton or six and a half tons per year uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. Your potential is down to 4.8 tons per year. That's metric tons. So typical new house, 3.6. Okay, let's look at part of the report there's the amount of heat loss that occurs for areas during the time of the assessment is if were you to do the recommended upgrade what that heat loss would drop to 
So if you notice on the attic, we went from 17 gigajoules down to six. Main walls stayed the same. We didn't recommend any upgrades for the main walls. Windows, we looked at replacing a few windows that were outdated and uh, damaged. Doors stayed the same. Basement, there was one little spot in the basement that was one insulated, uninsulated that we looked at, at uh, adding insulation to. And air leakage and ventilation, well, we went from 35 to 28 gigajoules a year. Substantial savings. So, before and after energy use, well, space heating, that's still the major one, but we went from 95 gigajoules down to 70. Space cooling stayed the same. Water heating, well, we were looking at replacing water heater with a high efficiency. It went from 26 down to 16. Ventilation, there was no ventilation in the home. Lights and appliances stays exactly the same. Other electrical stays exactly the same. We didn't recommend any changes in there because they already had LED lighting, etc., throughout the house. So, what that's able to do is it's able to give you information now that you can use, okay, in order to prioritize your uh, your uh, upgrades to your home. And one of the major ones that we're looking at, of course, is heat loss. Okay. Basically, three methods of that happening. One is convection. Fluid transfers heat from one surface to another. And if you think about it, that's uh, basically warm air rises, cold air drops. And as the warm air rises and it's in contact with another surface, it will give off heat to that surface and then rotate down as it cools and pick up more heat and basically move heat from one area to another. Conduction, well, that's surfaces in contact. Uh, you stick your hand on a hot frying pan, you just bent conduction heat. Radiation, heat transfer without physical contact. And that's where you're standing beside a light bulb and you hold your hand out, you can feel the heat on one side of your hand. That's radiant heat that you're feeling. And all three of these come into play in a typical building. So if we want to look at, at methods of reducing the heat loss in there, let's get a, uh, an idea of where they're occurring. Okay. So convective heat loss, well, air movement. And we've got three methods of doing it. One is wind effect. And that's, you get a wind blowing on one face of a house. Uh, one side of the house has got a high pressure area on the outside. The other three sides, because of the air flowing around them, have a low pressure area. And so what you'll find is the windows, for example, on the side that's windy, you'll get drafts through them and you're forcing warm air out through the, uh, through the far side. Stack effect, well, warm air rises. So any leaks at the top are going to cause warm air to leak out through the building envelope. And any leaks at the bottom are going to cause cooler outside air to come in. As that air warms, moves up to the top, exits the building again. The other one that quite often happens nowadays, especially with newer homes, is combustion of ventilation effect. Okay. You get things like your bathroom vent fan, the range hood, the dryer, if you've got interior fireplaces, if you've got anything that's uh, your furnaces drawing interior air, what you're doing is you're drawing air out of the house and it's going to be replaced by air leakage and that's going to be cold air coming in that you're gonna to have to heat up again in order to uh, maintain an interior temperature. So, convective heat loss is one that's uh, somewhat simple to deal with. It's mainly dealing with air sealing. Reduce the air leakage rates and you reduce the convective heat loss. And remember, you're typically you're looking at about one third of your, uh, your heat loss in a home. It could be considered convective. So, where do we look? I would 
would suggest we start out looking at any penetration through the attic. And here we've got a chimney, we've got an attic hatch, we've got lights that are in the ceiling, uh, we've got the plumbing stack running up through the attic. Uh, these areas are typically poorly sealed. Okay, then I would suggest you start looking at around the foundation headers and then electrical boxes around doors and windows, etc. And there's all kinds of strategies that you can use to reduce the actual air leakage once you've detected it and determine where it is. And if you're not doing a blower door test, one of the ways is you turn your all of your exhaust fans on, including your dryer, and close all the windows, and then take a couple of incense sticks and just walk around, check around your electrical receptacles, check around your windows, around window trim, especially around baseboards on the main floor and around headers, uh, particularly in the basement. When you see the air, the, the smoke being disturbed from the smoke pencil, you know that you're inside an area where, or you're at an area where there is some, some air leakage through it. So if you can reduce the air leakage, you can often reduce your, uh, your heat loss by anywhere from 25 to 30%. Okay, next one we look at is insulation. Well, what insulation is designed for is to reduce conductive heat loss. Okay, surfaces in contact. Uh, insulation works, it's rated at an R value per inch of thickness, and the R value is resistance to heat transfer. Okay, so the higher the R value, and the higher the R value of the insulation that you're buying, the more effective it's going to be at reducing heat loss. Okay, it can also reduce air leakage, uh, especially if you're using uh, board insulation and you're sealing all the joints between it, then you can do a substantial reduction in air leakage as well. And insulation is used in a cavity or it's applied to a surface. Let's have a look at some of the uh, some of the cases where it works. Okay, our priorities for insulating. Well, you want to start with uninsulated surfaces. If there's no insulation there, anything you put there is going to help. Then you want to look at underinsulated surfaces. In other words, surfaces that have got less than optimal insulation. So let's have a look at some scenarios here. Basement, uh, if you notice this guy, concrete block wall, typical pre-1970 construction, no insulation in the walls. Uh, this is probably a major heat loss uh, for this particular home. Uninsulated altogether. Now, there's one method of doing it. Energy Shield or any of the styrofoam products, they get glued to the wall, the joints get taped, and what you find is, there you go, you've got a complete barrier all the way around. Um, if you're looking at finishing the uh, interior surface, you can frame inside of that and you could add blanket insulation or pad insulation inside if you, uh, uh, if you wanted to. Another one for unfinished insulation or basements, okay, is blanket insulation. This stuff rolls out. It's got the poly coating on the one side to use for a vapor barrier. You roll it out, attach it to the wall, and tape the seams, and you're done. Spray foam. The good thing about spray foam is it's got a high R value per inch, so you don't need as much of a coating on. And secondly, it's also good at air sealing. And if you notice here, you can see this is the top of the basement wall, and you can see the uh, floor joists uh, coming out from the uh, from the sill plate. You're able to seal right up into that floor joist cavity, which is a difficult one to seal when you're uh, uh, when you're uh, just trying to use uh, bats and, and uh, poly and etc. So it's also able to uh, seal. Uh, air leakage around it. And if you got a basement that looks like this, don't insulate it yet. You've got to reduce the water. Uh, 
if you were to insulate this, one of the issues you would have is creating mold. And secondly, you would find the humidity levels in the house would go up substantially, particularly if in addition to doing insulation, you did uh, air sealing as well, because that water is going to evaporate, that basement's going to become warmer, water is going to evaporate into the house, and it could give you humidity issues right throughout the house. So, next one in line, attics. Well, usually these are insulated, but quite often under-insulated. If you notice, this one's got six inches of insulation in it. Basically, it's an R20, okay? That is very easy to convert to that. Uh, that's a well around the uh, attic hatch. And if you'll notice, we've got 24 inches of insulation in it now. Okay, and so what we've got is we've just taken that ceiling from R20 up to R80. And that's going to make a substantial difference in, uh, in heat loss. If you go back to uh, uh, Go back to where we, we looked at the assessment report. You can see the difference that made in uh, in that particular home. Okay, walls. Well, here we've got a good one. Uh, somebody once stuck uh, styrofoam insulation over top of the exterior of a wall structure. And if you notice here, what we got is drill a hole into the wall cavity. Nothing in the cavity, and. You've got a half inch of styrofoam, which gives you R2 over top of the wall structure. So if you're dealing with something like this, you need a contractor to do it. And what they do is they will come. And if you'll notice, they're drilling holes in each of the stud cavities. And then they're going to blow in insulation and fill those stud cavities full of insulation. And you can see here what it should look like when they're finished with it that's a dense pack cellulose insulation in there. One of the things I would suggest if you're uh, getting a contractor into low insulation into your wall structures is that you let them know that you're anticipating having somebody come back and do a thermal scan of the exterior of the building when they're finished. That way, they're more apt to ensure that they fill all the cavities properly and uh, they don't leave any gaps in there anywhere because you'll never find them from the inside. Okay, the other option for walls is doing a board insulation. Typically over the exterior, uh, it just, the nice thing about it is it covers the studs as well as the, uh, as well as the cavities. And if you'll notice here, the joints have all been taped and sealed. It's going to do a major job in reducing air leakage. And so you're going to end up with a lot less air leakage as well as improving the ER value of the, uh, uh, of the uh, wall structure. Windows, well, windows, they haven't made real major improvements in windows in quite a while. Uh, if you've got a dual pane window, the least your R value is, is going to be R2. Okay, and that's with uh, standard dual pane with a metal spacer in it. Uh, if you look at some of the best windows we make, it's an R3.8. So not huge improvements in, in, in windows. Your best bet there is number one, air seal the openings around them. If you've got uh, a check around the, uh, around the trimmer on the window, if there's air leakage there, caulking, Etc. Okay, and then second, replace them with Energy Star windows when you go to replace the windows. Okay, so let's get looking now at we've, we've looked at our heat loss. Let's now look at what we do as far as a heating system. And the first thing we want to examine is let's look at the cost of heating fuels as far as the carbon dioxide output. And what this chart shows you is how many pounds of carbon dioxide is produced per million BTUs by the following fuels. And this is relevant in Ontario. Okay, wood, zero. Yes, it produces lots of carbon dioxide, but it's considered carbon neutral simply because the wood is going to, if left in nature, is going to rot and, and actually oxidize. And so that, that carbon would end up back in the atmosphere. Okay, 
is the fossil fuels that we're looking at. Okay, oil, 161.3 pounds per million BTUs. Propane, a little better than that, 139 pounds. Natural gas, 117. And electricity, 4.94. And that is simply because we produce very little of our electricity using thermal. Uh, now what we're using is mainly nuclear and hydroelectric. So we don't have any coal fired plants anymore. So that's why that electricity is so low in, in carbon output. Okay, let's look at the typical system efficiency. Well, you got an oil furnace, you're probably range anywhere from 52% to a maximum of 78%. Propane and natural gas, they run about 65% up to 97%. Electricity, if you're using baseboard electric heating, 100%. Every watt of electricity is converted to a watt of heat. And then if we look at heat pumps, Okay, you've got the potential to run between 250% and 420%. In other words, every watt of heat that you use to operate that system will produce 4.2 watts of heat in the house if it's running at 420%. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the systems. Bad furnace. <laughs> yeah, this one, if you'll notice down here, there's a rather large opening and it's got a metal chimney. And this guy is 24 hours a day. It's exhausting air out through here and up through there and out the chimney just to keep the furnace warm or keep the chimney warm so that when it fires up, you're able to move the exhaust gas to the exterior. Uh, pretty inefficient, typically running mid 60s as far as efficiency. Okay, we got something a little different here now. This furnace is a condensing oil or uh, condensing natural gas furnace. And if you notice over here, we've got one pipe coming in that's bringing the fresh air in for combustion of the fuel. And there's the exhaust pipe for exhaust of the fuel. It's capable of extracting up to 97% of the heat contained in that natural gas and converting it to heat in the interior of the house. Bad boiler. This one's a real beast. Uh, if you'll notice, this boiler used to be a coal-fired boiler. You can see the grill right here where the coal went in. They replaced the coal-fired boiler with a, whoop, and I just replaced the coal-fired boiler, or coal-fired uh, system with an oil uh, gun. And it is operating at mid 50s as far as efficiency. And if you'll notice all of this white material over on the sides of the, uh, of the boiler, that's quite probably asbestos. So it's something you may want to get rid of anyway. Here we go, about 82% efficient natural gas. Um, and they run up to whatever size you're going to need. And basically they're exhausting out through the chimney once again. And then we look at the best boiler, okay? Condensing instantaneous boiler. What it will do is it will operate up to about 95% efficiency and it actually extracts much more heat out of your fuel than any other of the, uh, of the boiler systems. So if you've got baseboard electric heating, then one of the things you may want to consider, rather than replacing the entire heating system, is looking at a heat pump. Okay, this is an air source heat pump. Sits outside, looks an awful lot like an air conditioner unit because they work very similar to an air conditioner unit. The inside coil can either be in your furnace, if you have a furnace, and what it will do is this system will operate down to about minus 20 and it provides heat to the interior of the house and typically 
and then depending on the outside temperature of anywhere from 250 to about 300%. If you don't have a furnace and you get baseboard electric heat, we take a look here. This is a head that can be put inside the house. And typically you want to let, you want to put them in open areas. And what this will do is actually circulate heat inside that area of the house. And remember, heat pump can also be used for cooling. So it will act as an air conditioner as well during the summer time. Ground source heat pump. <coughs> Basically what we've got is you, you see these two pipes down here, that's cold water coming in from outside. And in this case, there's 1500 feet of pipe buried in the ground. And what that's it allowing us to do is we bring water in at about five degrees Celsius. We strip some of the heat off of it. And that heat then gets cranked up by the compressor and it's distributed to the interior of the house. This particular unit is 420% efficient. Now, they're a little more expensive to install, but uh, in the long term, there is a good payback period for them, depending on what you're replacing. Then I guess our last thing that we want to, might want to look at is looking at renewable energy. Uh, nowadays, the province does not have a program to, if you're grid tied, for you to put a system up that will produce some of your demand. And when you're producing more than what you're using, it goes out onto the grid and it runs your hydrometer backwards. Okay, so you can produce some of your usage and you don't have to store it in batteries. You can just apply it directly back to the grid, use the big the grid for a big battery storage. So you can reduce your electrical cost down to zero, okay, through this, but uh, you are not going to be able to generate uh, electricity and sell it to hydro. Uh, hopefully we'll be getting back to a program like that shortly where we get distributed generation and People are able to uh, people are able to actually put power back to the grid, okay, and and reduce our uh, uh, our dependence on nuclear and and, uh, and our transmission lines. So I think we've pretty much covered it now. Uh, uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to stop the uh, uh, the slide presentation. And I think now what we can do is we can spend some time in questions. Okay. Thanks, Miles. That was um, incredibly informative presentation. I know I have a lot of strategies and things to look into at my own home right now. Um, and yeah, I'm also quite excited to look for opportunities to reduce our operating costs and our GHG emissions as well. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, I did notice that uh, one participant raised their hand. Um, is that for a question? And if so, if, if you'd like to uh, share your question. Okay, we'll come back to the raised hand. Um, Miles, our first question is, what are your thoughts on air to water heat pumps and their efficiency? They, they are actually quite efficient. Now, if you're talking for domestic hot water, uh, one of the issues with, uh, with an air to water heat pump is that it is extracting heat from the area that the water heater is in. Okay, which makes it great during the summertime because it's almost like putting an air conditioner in your basement and using that excess heat to heat your hot water. During the winter time though, 
reality is that what you're doing is you're extracting heat that you put in with your principal heating system. Okay, so it's no more efficient than your primary heating system during the winter. Okay, thanks, Miles. Um, our next question is, are there currently any government subsidies available for improving energy efficiency? The only subsidy available at this point in time are, there are two of them. One is through Enbridge Union Gas. And uh, if you uh, are heating with, uh, with natural gas, then they have a program available and I, in the resource list that uh, uh, that will be available at the end of the program, uh, there's a uh, a link there to the Enbridge program. Okay, and they will assist in doing insulation, in doing air sealing, in replacing heating systems, in replacing domestic hot water systems, etc. The other one is uh, it's. Uh, actually uh, uh, income based, but it's through, uh, uh, through the IESO. And once again, I put a link in the resources there to the IESO program. And that is for electrically heated homes. Okay, and they will actually uh, come in and do the insulating for you. Okay, so those are the only two at this point. Now I noticed uh, yesterday uh, when I was listening to Trudeau's little spiel that one of the things he's talking about was uh, uh, talking about reducing uh, uh, energy use. And he was sort of hinting that there may be some federal incentives coming on, uh, on that. But at this point, no, there, there are really no government incentives uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce the uh, energy use in the home. Thanks, Miles. Um, are the new dry, our next question is, are the new dryer heat pump units worth the extra cost? I would suggest yes, they are. Uh, and the interesting thing with them is reality is what they're doing is uh, <laughs> they're using one half the unit as a as a heater okay and they're using the other half of the unit as a condenser almost like a dehumidifier so in reality you're not exhausting air out of the home okay and really the only uh, the only thing that leaves the home is the moisture out of the clothes. Whereas right now, basically a clothes dryer, what it's doing is it takes air out of the interior of the house, it heats it up, uses it to evaporate air out of the clothes, and then puts that outside. Okay, so yes, they can make a, they can make a substantial difference in, uh, particularly if, if you do a lot of laundry. Our next question is, can you solar heat a poured garage floor? Uh, an existing floor is a little rough to do. If you were, what I would suggest is, this is something you'd have to look at during the construction phase, because one of the things that you wanna do is get yourself a good insulation layer underneath the slab. Okay. And then you can use some solar water panels on the roof of the structure. Okay. And a small pump along with a thermostat to circulate that water through radiant heat piping in the garage floor. And you're going to want to have some decent insulation in the garage, etc. But also, if the floor is not insulated underneath, you're going to have quite a large amount of heat loss down through the slab into the ground, and I would suggest it's not going to uh, not going to work for you. Whereas, if you're designing the garage 
and you're looking at, uh, you know, you don't want to keep it at 70 degrees, but you want to get some heat into the grid, then yeah, I would think solar panels on the roof, okay. Uh, insulate the slab and put radiant piping in the slab to, uh, to distribute the heat. Thanks, Miles. Uh, our next question is, based on Ontario's current energy production mix, it seems problematic to recommend natural gas or propane as a system to move to, unless you are just trying to make a current unit more efficient. There may be a couple questions in, in there, um, but if you can maybe speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, you're absolutely right. Electrical usage, if we're looking at it strictly from the uh, point of view of carbon dioxide emissions, Electrical usage by far is the cleanest fuel that you, can, that you can use. If everybody were to right now switch to electric heat, our grid would collapse. We do not have the distribution system to be able to handle everybody heating electrically. So what we're having to look at is we're having to look at the compromise. Uh, there's no incentive right now for doing solar electric Okay, so we can't get into realistically into distributed generation. Um, and my suggestion would be is what we're looking at there is we're looking at doing the least harm we can. So if you're in an area where there's natural gas available and you've got an oil furnace, you can make a substantial difference. Okay, just simply by switching from oil to natural gas. The other thing is it'll make a big difference in the operating cost. And it's also, you're not storing 200 gallons of toxic material on your property. Okay, which if you get a leak in an oil tank, boy, it's expensive to clean out. And your insurance company, if you're on oil, is probably charging you an additional premium of four to $500 a year for having that oil tank on your property. So that can be uh, uh, reduced as well. And I think what we're looking at here is we're trying to do the least harm that's feasible to do. Okay, so, you know, yes, electricity is, is, is an option, but it's an option that not everybody can use. Okay, so then what you look at is, well, what is the next best fuel. And if you're in a location where it's served by natural gas, there you go. Uh, if not, then I would definitely suggest propane versus uh, oil. And for two reasons. Number one, you're reducing the carbon output. Uh, okay. And secondly, you're not storing uh, oil on your property. When you store propane, that is the responsibility of the propane provider to make sure that the tank and the uh, and the system is uh, is adequate. Great, thanks, Miles. Um, our next question: Have you ever come across brick failure when an old house is wrapped in insulation? No, I haven't. Uh, if you put insulation on the exterior of the brick, then what should happen is you will end up with uh, the brick now being on the interior face of the insulation, now on the warm side. Okay, so you don't have an issue with uh, condensation in it, etc. Uh, if you're leaving the brick on the exterior, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues you're going to have especially when you uh, insulate the interior, is ensuring that you reduce the air leakage and that you install a vapor barrier. Without the vapor barrier, the moisture can migrate through the insulation into the brick structure where it freezes. Okay, that'll create spalling in the, uh, in the brick. And yes, you can damage the brick uh, uh, face. So you definitely want to reduce your air leakage and ensure that you've got a decent vapor barrier uh, if you're putting insulation on the interior of a brick uh, a building. Great. Well, thank you, Miles, for joining us here today. Um, 
I know if I can speak on behalf of everybody that I've definitely learned a number of different things and have a number of different things to take away as well to apply within my own home. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, there will be a list of resources made available uh, following the webinar. And as well as if you've missed any of the information that was provided during this webinar, um, this webinar has been recorded and it will be made available on GBBR's YouTube channel. So thank you everybody for joining us here today and have a great day. Bye-bye now.